Amen. Aloha and welcome to Amen Podcast, where we preach the good news of Jesus Christ and how it applies to everyday life. I'm Lakilani, your host, and I'm here with my husband, Alex. The title of today's sermon is called Finna, and we're just continuing our series in Matthew, looking at chapter 9, verses 27 through 33 in the ESV version today. So if you have your ESV Bible, go ahead and grab it now and follow along. Or if you wanna follow along on the Bible app, that's awesome too. If you don't have either of those, that's totally fine as well. So just follow along and listen. Um, Before we do so, I just wanted to thank you guys for all of your ratings and your reviews and encourage those who have not yet if you would like to rate and review the podcast that just helps this message go out to more people Um, also liking the video on youtube is another way that helps this message get shared and so if you've been blessed by this ministry um we'd appreciate if you did that for us um but you guys really feel like family and we're so grateful for you guys and so we truly truly thank you for all that you've done for us Well, let's read verse 27. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through that, all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-possessed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. Amen. Verse 27 starts off, Jesus pass on. Jesus passed on from there. He has just healed, you know, the woman that was bleeding for 12 years, healed the young girl who's 12 years old, uh, brought her back to life. And now, as he's moving on from there, he encounters two blind guys. These blind guys, Charles Spurgeon was saying that they're on one accord, like they're they're together in what they say to Jesus. They, they're together in their blindness. They're together in their journey to get unblind. Uh, they're together in, they're of one heart and one mind. And I love that because that's a picture of um, the, the church. Those of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to be of one heart and one mind when we come to Jesus and ask him for help. And so, what these guys are going to encounter and what the mute man is going to encounter is what Jesus is finna do. Mm. Finna is probably the earliest slang word that I remember, you know, and in, in, in California, people say hella a lot too, similar to finna. But finna it probably has originated in the South uh, because it's a shorter way of saying fixin' to. Um, I'm fixin' to go get gas and put it in my truck. Um, we have shortened it in our culture and to finna. I'm finna go get gas, put it in my truck. It's just a shorter way of saying things. And in our culture, we use it a lot. And I want you to just hear this word and I want you to associate it with the Lord. Because in this particular story today, no one has ever healed the blind by a touch. No one has ever Heal the blind, period. This is the first historical event of someone giving sight to the blind. What it's a picture of is what God is going to do to all of us. Because all of us are spiritually blind. We can't see the things that God sees. I remember there's a there's an image of like this um this student that went to school at the school that my dad worked at. And I remember being like probably Amos's age, eight years old, and seeing this person walk down the road with a red cane and uh, with the red stick, you know, with the, the, the white line at the bottom. And I asked my mom, what, what is that? What are they doing? And uh, 
it was my first time seeing a blind person in, in public. And I remember I was so riddled with sin at that time. It was I was hiding a lot of things from my parents. I was, I think, in fourth or fifth grade, um, so a little bit older than Amos. But um, I remember feeling like I was in darkness and then seeing someone walk around in darkness. And I could see perfectly fine. I could see, you know, light is everywhere. It was a sun, it was a sunny day. And this person is walking around in darkness and yet I was the one who really couldn't see. And that was such a odd feeling. I can, if I close my eyes, I can see this person. I can see the street. I can see where mm -hmm. they're walking. Mm -hmm. And they didn't see, she, it was a girl. She mm -hmm. didn't seem scared. Mm -hmm. She didn't seem upset. She didn't seem angry with their life. It was, this is all she knows. Like Bane says to Batman, uh, you merely adapted to the darkness. I was born in it. I was experiencing such a heavy darkness and I didn't know how to get out of it. And it was over a decade later when I actually got out of it. And it was Christ that brought me out of it. I was blind. Even though I was in church, pastor's kid, my dad was working at a Christian college. Even though I had Christian friends, we went to Christian youth groups, Awanas, all that kind of stuff, or Awana. I don't know why we add S to everything, like Revelations. I went to Awana, all this stuff. I was still super blind. When, in verse 27 and 28, when the, when the two blind men said, have mercy on a son of David, they know this person is the promised king of Israel. That's what that term means. God promised that he would give the kingdom to a descendant of David, and that kingdom would never end. And that person was the one that was coming to establish a new world order, a new kingdom. Everything was going to change for the people of Israel. They waited and waited and waited for this new king. After hearing about these miracles, these blind guys are like, he's the one. How did they get there? How did they even know he was there when he was passing by? Someone must have been saying, whoa, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. They must have heard, the Bible doesn't say they're deaf, they're blind. So they are able to hear Jesus is coming. The question is, are you listening? You can be spiritually blind, in darkness, not seeing where God is moving, not seeing God in your life, but your heart is longing for more. There's a God-shaped hole in you that hears, that can hear, okay, where is this the way? Let us not be blind and deaf. Now, I know, spiritually speaking, we are blind and, and uh, I'm sorry, yeah, spiritually speaking, we are blind and deaf. Spiritually speaking, we're dead, technically. But let us be like these blind men. When God calls, let us follow so we can have new sight. Check it out. It says, verse 28, he entered the house and the blind men came to him. Jesus said to him, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Why did he wait to enter the house? I talked about this in my separate podcast. Jesus was trying to run away from popularity again. Jesus was choosing to not clout chase. And so that is perhaps why commentators say he waited not to heal them outside, but as they got into the house, when the door closed and they said, you know, okay, everyone, Jesus is, you know, he's going to retire back to the home now. When people walked away, he healed him. He was intentional. He's also an intentional savior. Another reason why he could have waited to be in the house is because he wanted to give these guys sight intentionally, personally. How does Jesus usually heal? He usually heals by touching. Verse 29, he touched their eyes. They've never been touched like this ever before. They will never be able to forget that feeling of the Son of God, God in the flesh, touching their eyelids. They'll never be able to forget that feeling. And neither will you be able to forget the feeling of when God touched you for the first time, when he changed your life. 
Our God is a personal savior. Jesus is a personal savior. In the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament, that's Jesus. Jesus and God the Father are one. And back then, in Genesis, he was personal. The Bible says he breathed life into Adam. He's a personal God. He personally brought the ark to rest on Mount Ararat. He's a personal God. He personally talked to Abraham. He personally met with Moses. And now he has decided to personally meet with you because he loves you. When he's giving sight to these guys, he's showing, this is what I'm finna do, spiritually speaking. On the cross, we were gonna be given new life. Because of his death, we're given new life. Because of his perfect sacrifice, obeying God's law that we had broken perfectly, and because God is a holy God, they can't overlook sin, Jesus gave us his righteousness, and he took our sins upon himself. Mm. What that means is, because we are now covered in his righteousness, we've been given his life, now we can see with his eyes the mm. things that we had not seen before. We're not in the darkness anymore. He has touched your life and brought you into his marvelous light. As we go through Matthew, before we get to the cross, we're seeing Jesus do all these things to point to what he came to do. By healing this physical, these physical blind guys, he's saying, this is what I'm finna do. Now listen, it gets even better. He says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They say, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be done to you. What faith does, faith brings you to a place in order to be encountered by God. That's what faith does. God gives you faith so that you can come to a place to be encountered by him. You cannot get there on your own. Remember, blind people don't know where to go. That's us, spiritually blind. We don't know where to go. We don't know where to see. We, we wouldn't even know where to take the first step. Faith is God giving you, guiding you by the hand and saying, this is where to go. Will you place your faith in Jesus? He says, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes opened. And he sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. Again, he's not clout chasing. He's staying away from that. He has a mission. Verse 31, but he went away and, but they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. What Jesus is finna do wasn't stopped by their disobedience. What happens here is these, Jesus still heals them knowing they're gonna disobey him. Jesus still touches their life knowing that he's going to make he's going to tell them sternly not to do something and they're still going to do it but that doesn't stop Jesus from doing it. Jesus encounters and touches people's lives regardless of their maturity of faith. We can be so someone calling um, we can be so mean to people who uh, are new to church, people who are uh, haven't been to church in a long time. We can be so mean to them because we expect them to be mature in their faith. We expect them just to grow up and to start living like us because we really got it going on. That's ridiculous. All of us were blind at some point. And what's worse is a lot of us put our blindfolds on after God has given us sight. Disobeying God is a form of trying to blind yourself. God is telling you to go that way, you go the other way. It's as if you're blinding yourself to the way that God has illuminated. But Jesus sees these guys 
in his foresight, disobeying him, but he still heals them. He still touches them. Why? He is not thinking about the maturity of their faith. He's thinking about the sincerity of their faith. Their faith was sincere. That's why I said, according to your faith, be it done to you. If there's people coming to your Bible study, coming to your church, coming to your hangouts, coming into your friend groups, coming into your presence, and they aren't living the way that you know God would have them live, ask yourself, okay, what is the maturity of their faith? What is the maturity of my faith? Can I show this person grace? Does Christ look at this person's maturity of faith or at the sincerity of their faith? It's both. They do need to mature. But understand that God has grace for the immature of faith. He's had grace for me. He's had grace for you. When our faith was immature, let us have grace for others as well. Now, Another thing that Jesus is going to do is allow those who are mute to speak, spiritually mute. Look at this. Uh, verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. So the, the, the blind men leave, and someone who knows Jesus is at this house brings a demon-possessed mute person to them. Now, we don't see this a ton in Scripture, but it, it's here's an example of what the demonic realm is able to do physically to someone, to make them mute. Can this still happen? Of course it can still happen. It happens in probably mostly seen in other countries because I believe the, the demonic realm has made us mute in different ways, not physically, speaking, but he's made us um, afraid to talk about our faith. He's made us afraid to um, be honest, to be vulnerable, to confess our sins to one another. He's made it um, kind of embarrassing and kind of cringe to be a Christian um, in public, you know, or he's made it super popular and trendy and um, monetary to be a Christian online. And so you have a lot of Christians um, that are super lukewarm and super flippant with their faith, making lots of Christian memes and jokes. Um, and he's fine with you. The devil is fine with you talking that way about God until you're blue in the face because there's no real change or conviction or um, seriousness behind it. Mm -hmm. So either he's going to try to get you to joke about your faith or he's going to try to get you to not talk about it at all. In other countries... This kind of physical muteness is still happening. And it happens in our country too. There's, I think like at least once in my life, I've woken up, um, and this might have happened to you too, with a form of paralysis where I cannot speak. I try to speak and I cannot, and I'm fully awake. My eyes are open. I'm looking at my room. Uh, and, and the one time that that happened, when I said the word Jesus, I was able to speak. And so this stuff still happens. When Jesus sees this guy, it says, verse 33, and when, the dim, and when the demon had been cast out, a mute man, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled. Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees, oh, that's next week's. Never like this, never anything like this has ever been seen in Israel. Jesus is showing them what he's finna do for Israel. Israel is the people of God. Jesus came to get his people first. Because that's only right. The promised Messiah, the promised salvation was to everyone. But first, the people he chose to bring the Messiah into the world were the Jewish people. So how it would be so wrong if Christ came down here and not focused on meeting them first, on drawing the chosen children of Israel back to God. So he does that. Most of them reject him. And it was always his plan to go after the Gentiles. But just take that as an example. You're, when you're um, a parent 
Your children need to come first. How dare we evangelize everyone outside the home without evangelizing our own home? Paul says, that's even proof that you're not a very good pastor. If the, ki- if the people closest to you, you have not reached your own family. Your children need to come first. So he goes after them first and he's showing them what I'm finna do. I'm finna give sight to the blind spiritually. I'm, I'm, I'm finna give you the ability to speak where you have not been able to speak before. How has your sin, how has the enemy muted you? I almost call this episode mute um, because it's something we use in our culture a lot. My phone was on mute. Um, or I put this person on mute. And the way we're going to be able to look at our life and say, okay, what is what do I feel God is finna do in my life? I have to look at the places where God has given me sight and God has, has given me the ability to speak. Mm-hmm. If you have children, you are not on mute. If you have some kind of platform, you are not on mute. Even if that platform is you lead your FCA or your crew or your young life. Even if that uh, platform is you're the only Christian in your family. Even if that platform is, you know, you're standing next to somebody in a long line and you like their shirt and you guys start talking about the shirt. That's a platform. You're not on mute. Because Christ is in your life. You're not on mute. The Bible says... They brought the mute man who was possessed with a demon to Jesus. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. Because you've been brought to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, drawing you to Christ, pulling you by the hand, God the Father giving you the faith to come to Jesus and to trust him, because there's no other name under heaven that can be that which a man can be saved. Once you've placed your faith in him, according to your faith, let it be done to you. You are now saved. You are now with Christ. Mm -hmm. The demon is gone, cast out. The the demonic realm has no power over you. Now you're able to speak. How will you speak? Now you're able to see what will you look at. Don't you see? He's showing us in this passage what he's finna do in your life, but also what he's finna do in the narrative of the gospel. He's still not at the cross yet. So we're going to keep seeing more images like this. We're going to keep being reminded, okay, God, How are you moving in my life? I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's a noisy episode. No, I was just kidding. Um, It was actually noisier last week with Luke in the the van with us. We like that you guys are able to hear, like, just the creaking of the floorboards and notifications and phones dropping and stuff like that, Bible turning, uh, because it makes makes you and us feel like we're in the same room together. But another thing that he's showing us that he's finna do is he's finna... Destroy the demonic realm. Mm. He casts out the demon. When Jesus dies on the cross, the devil loses. The spiritual, uh, the spiritual little G, lowercase G gods, lose. This is what the cultures of the Old Testament thought of these guys as. Little lowercase G gods. They had power. Crazy power, crazy wisdom. All the spiritual evil beings lose when he dies on the cross. They think he, they won. Peter tells us by quoting Enoch, which is a book that's not in the canon, but Peter recalls the story of this extra biblical literature in his letter, 1 Peter 1 and 2, and he talks about Jesus going down to the grave when he dies and preaching to the spirits in hell. What does that mean? He went there to declare to the spiritual beings they lost. You lose. You guys think I'm dead right now. You think I'm going to stay here in the grave with you. I'm getting out of here. You guys are staying here. Mm -hmm. That's heavy. This is a glimpse of that. The spiritual beings are shaking in their boots when this mute man speaks, when they see the demon cast out. He's showing them what I'm finna do as I'm finna kick y'all's behind. No more will you have power over my people. 
He's showing them the victory that he's finna secure. He's finna give sight to the blind spiritually. He's finna let the mute speak spiritually. He's finna free the captives that were spiritually bound to the demonic realm. Mm. So if that is what God is finna do in your life, you need to take the blinders off. Lokilani this week, as we were talking about and praying about this episode, she said, we gotta burn the blinders. God has given you sight. Don't keep blinding yourself. You blind yourself by your disobedience. You blind yourself um, by the things you choose to partake in, the things you choose to ingest spiritually, and open up your mouth and speak. Stop acting like you're mute. You can speak. Christ is in your life. He's given you places where you need to speak up. Speak up. Stop allowing people to mistreat you because what that does is when you allow someone to mistreat you and you know they're mistreating you, that is sin on your behalf too. Because God has given you a voice to say stop. I was watching this like um, video about toddlers and how to like communicate with them. And this person was saying, when you put your hand up and you spread your hand to make your hand as big as possible, try to pretend you're get, you have Shaq hands or LeBron James hands and you put your hand up and you say, stop, no. What that does to a person, not just even a toddler, is it communicates, I'm not playing around. God has given you a voice to speak up for his glory. Mm -hmm. How will you do that? Mm -hmm. Don't allow it, take the muzzle off, burn the blinders. But last of all, keep away from the demonic You've been free from that bondage. Where is the demonic realm trying to put its feelers out into your life? Let us not go back to those places. Mm -hmm. What happens next um, in the next episode, uh, it's gonna be called Gatekeeper. And we're gonna see Jesus, the real gatekeeper, take down the little gatekeepers who are trying to keep um, control over the believers. And he's going to give the control back to us. Mm. And so we're, we're, we're excited to talk about that. But it ends here by saying in verse 33, um, never was anything like this seen in Israel. What Christ does he gives us the ability to see by him going into the darkness. Mm -hmm. He was blinded so we could see. Mm -hmm. He was put on mute so we could speak. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he's seeing is, I can't see you. Father, I can't see you. Did heaven respond? No. That meant they couldn't hear him. He was blinded, he was muted, so we could see and so we could speak to God. Mm -hmm. So we could speak for the glory of God. We don't speak for God. God speaks for himself. We speak for the glory of God. We repeat what he has already said in his word. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's speaking for God, be careful. Because God has spoken. He's given us the power to repeat his words. Mm -hmm. And Christ became a captive so we could be free. So as you, as you look at your life and you say, okay, God, where have you given me vision? Where have you given me sight? Where have you given me opportunities to speak in my home, outside my home? Looking at those places, where have you given me freedom? Looking at those places will help you answer the question, where do I feel, what do I feel God is finna do in my life? What do you feel God is finna do in your life? As you look at the places where God has given you sight, God has given you the ability to speak, and God has given you freedom. What do you feel God is finna do in your life? Father God, we thank you so much for giving us the ability um, to see you in your word, and we pray God that we would 
um, just take our time to really answer what it means, Lord, um, to see you um, do things in our life, God, and use us to be your hands and feet. We thank you, God, for the resurrection and our our great high priest who lives and made a way for us to be free to see and to speak. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, this is the part of the episode called After the Amen, where we ask you a question to help you apply this message to your life. And Alex shared the question already. What do you feel God's going to do? What do you feel God's going to do? And I think, you know, this is such a great question, and I feel like he has already been doing something in my life in this area, but I love how you spoke about, well, I mean, it came from the text, but um, just what the enemy has muted, God has given us, like, our voice back. And I I love that because um, I've ever shared this before, but just how... I shared even as mother of one, two, three kids of like, oh, like, what's my purpose? Like, I feel like the Lord has given me discernment. He's given me different ways of understanding his word. And he's given us some years of ministry experience and stuff like that. Like, what is my purpose in the kingdom? Like, how do I fit into this? You know, um, and... I love what you said about, like, there's a God-shaped hole in all of us, and um, we are, like, constantly trying to fill that with other things, and I think that's the same with, like, his purpose for a life, and, like, for me, like, I've been a mother for eight years now, but for years have struggled with, like, do I need to do more? You know, my own flesh desiring that, but then also the world's pressure, not even just the world, but even in Christ- within Christianity, we have women leading five ministries and mothering and having another part-time job or, like, whatever, you know. So I have, like, I had really struggled with that for years, even after having multiple children. And um, I think, like, the more I say yes to his purpose, which is to just go all all in with motherhood, Um, how eventually the desire for anything else um, will start to fade. And I think that's where I'm at now. And I think that he's restored a lot of joy within motherhood for me. Um, And because of that, I am praying and hoping that that produces fruit within my children's life um, from the type of mother I am and can be to them. And so, um, yeah, I think God is finna give me more, even more joy in motherhood, even more purpose in my home and just satisfaction and just going all in with that purpose. And I, yeah, this past week, I guess I've had just a few different conversations who that have been very encouraging um, because of me choosing to go all in mm-hmm. and just in mind blowing ways, just hearing feedback from s- some people. Um, and I love that. And I think, yeah, I'm just excited and it's just so worth it. We met someone today and she was like, you will never, she was a mother of six, but much older than us. And she was like, I always tell people like, you never regret the kids that you do have, but you may one day regret the ones you didn't have. And I think that's so true. And it was just such an encouragement to me to like, stop trying to feel, fill that hole in my life with other things and just, fill it with the Lord's purpose and what he's already called you to and called me to. So. Yeah, that's super cool. I I chuckled because she had a lot of encouragement this week and then she had a bad hip episode. (laughs) Oh yeah. Sciatica pain or whatever it might've been. We don't, we're going to figure it out with the doctor this week, but pray for her because she just got kind of had this 
inflamed, just, you know, physical ailment right after having those, you know, encouraging encounters. And, um, I, but I, I believe that is true that God is finna give you more joy in motherhood. I think God is finna make me a better dad. That's where he's given me sight, you know, he's giving me, you know, a platform with them. They listen to everything I say, you know, just when I was putting them down to bed right now, Amos said, wow, Lion, you're great. You're great at preaching because he said something biblical. <laughs> and Lion said, it's because my dad is always talking about the Bible. Um, and so they listen to me, you know, and I don't really care if you guys don't listen to me, if my kids don't. I love that you guys listen to me. It's, mm -hmm. it's awesome. But if my kids aren't listening to me, I could care less. <laughs> and you know, the truth is you could care less. Yeah. You guys would not be listening to me if you knew my kids weren't listening to me because mm. something's messed up with that. Yeah. And I think because my kids listen to me, it gives me the power to speak to you. Mm. Um, and so I'm just thankful for that. And I pray that God is able to, well, I know he's going to do that, you know, because um, like I said, he's given me sight there and given me mm. the ability to speak there and he's giving me freedom. And it's so funny. I was just talking to my friend this week or last week asking who is more free, the dad with preoccupied with his kids at the beach or the guy who's there with no responsibility, no schedule, no significant other, and he is on the prowl, looking for fresh meat, mm -hmm. head on a swivel. That person's enslaved mm -hmm. to their flesh. Mm -hmm. The dad is probably hungry, not caffeinated enough, <laughs> um, tired, but he's free. Mm -hmm. His hands are full mm -hmm. serving his children. He knows exactly who he is. He knows exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And there's nothing more important in the world that he could be doing. Mm. He's free. What we have to do is we have to burn the blinders. Mm -hmm. We have to unmuzzle ourselves. Yeah. And we have to walk away from the chains. I believe what we're doing is we're not necessarily chained up. We're free. Mm -hmm. But we're sitting with the chains on top of us. Mm -hmm. Like they're a weird blanket or something, mm -hmm. a, a strange, spiritual, evil, wicked, weighted mm -hmm. blanket. Mm -hmm. Move away from the chains, unmuzzle yourself, unblind yourself, take your blindfold off, burn it, and move and speak and see. If you had spiritual goggles and you could look around the people at your church, people in your Bible study, the people that you're friends with that are Christians, they're probably walking around with a blindfold and a muzzle on wearing chains around their neck, but not cuffed to them. Strange. And because all the other Christians around us are doing that, we think that's just the new fashion, spiritually speaking. We should just do that. We should muzzle ourselves. We should blind ourselves. No. I like what you're saying. That's good. Because, like, I think that we do muzzle ourselves. Like people muzzle us, but we muzzle ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. And I think about that, like the number one comment we get when we're out is. I don't know. <laughs> oh, you don't know? Oh, you got your hands full. Yeah, and yeah. I, I always wanna be like, yeah, like, you know, like kind of like entertain that person's comment. So to give context. Saying, yeah, sorry. Older people yeah. love to say to young couples who have a lot of kids, Wow, you sure got your hands full. Mm -hmm. We get it multiple times a week. Yeah. And what we know that they're kind of saying is like, you're crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. Why do you have so many kids? <laughs> um, it's definitely not encouraging. And Yeah. And so I want to like appease them usually. So I'll just be like, yeah, you know, but like. In a way, I mus I'm muzzling myself. I could think of it like, oh, they're muzzling me because of this. But, like, no, I do because I give in to it. 
and I don't like say something. Yeah, I could, it, what I could say is it's better than empty. <laughs> it's better than empty-handed. Yeah, and that but could then be that good. would be like I. I think I just am so fearful of that interaction, and like I don't want to like offend them, or I don't want to seem rude, or like you know. But am I being truthful by being like, yeah, like I. I want to have all these five kids. I want my hands full. And I'm, a, I'm thankful because some people don't have that opportunity. Yeah, and God tells us to be fruitful yeah. and multiply. And, like, there's been times where she has gotten mad at me because I've said to them, back to them, no, my hands are not full. Oh, I'll, I'll say, no, that's easy. Or, no, I, you know, I work from home, so we got it. And... um I try to say it in a nice way, but there's times where she's like, no, it's, you know, you yeah, need to be well, nice. Yeah, well, I don't think we need to be mean. But <laughs> we don't need to be mean, but I think, again, speak up for yourself. It's not okay that the whole world thinks it's not good to have a lot of kids. It's not okay that the world teaches that, mm -hmm. that we need to, you know, shove our kids off to the babysitter every chance we get, or we need to, you know, not, you know, only have one or two and settle down and make sure you have your career, make sure you put yourself first. You're never going to be free like that. Yeah. And yes. we get, we get, we would, you would never say that to Jacob. You would never say that to, you know, who else had a bunch of kids in the Bible? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a good example of choosing not to mosey yourself. Again, you don't have to be mean. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people um, were offended by things Christ said. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to allow people to keep offending you? That's good. Christ was offended by people. Mm -hmm. He turned the other cheek. But are you going to continue to live in fear mm -hmm. of offending those people with the standard that God has called you to? We can't live in fear of offending people mm -hmm. with the things of God. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what my episode on my podcast was about. Jesus never clout chased because the Bible tells us if everyone likes you, if everyone's praising you, that's not good. Mm -hmm. But if you have people who are clear enemies of you, you're in good company because mm. that's where Christ was. That's crazy. The world, pra the world praises things that God condemns. Mm -hmm. Beautiful stuff. What is God finna do in your life? What do you feel God is finna do in your life? We want to hear what you guys have to say. And we love you so much. Amenpodcast.com to support us and to keep us going. Keep it ad-free. Yeah. Anything else? That's it. <laughs> it's a slow one today, tonight, guys, but this has been fun. Mm -hmm. And we're excited to hear what you guys have to say. And we're already looking forward to the next episode. So be sure to subscribe, subscribe. follow, and we'll see you in the next one. Until then, go out and be the church. Amen.